Um, the Archaeological Research Facility is located in Weichen, the ancestral and unceded territory of chochenya speaking Ohlone people, successors of the historic and sovereign Verona Band of Alameda County. We acknowledge that this land remains of great importance to the Ohlone people and that the ARF community, us, inherits a history of archaeological scholarship that has disturbed Ohlone ancestors and made attempts to erase living Ohlone people from the present and future of this land. It is therefore our collective responsibility to critically transform our archaeological inheritance and practice in support of Ohlone sovereignty and to hold the University of California accountable to the needs of all Native and Indigenous people. And people here are doing that work, and I encourage everyone listening to figure out what the relationship is to those kinds of work. So today, it is my very great pleasure to introduce Mario Castillo, presenting on his PhD research. This is our form of exit talk in our department, right? Um, doing his work in Mexico, Mario uh, personifies the kind of community, kind of archaeology that we hope to teach here at this university. Um, he comes to us, when he first came to us uh, from Chicago, one of the people there who's famously sparing in his praise of anybody, and I've worked for this guy, uh, is he said that Mario was one of the very best, and he was absolutely the best. Um, he's done that work. You, you may have heard of some of these MacArthur geniuses and stuff, you know, who take a lot of the limelight, but it was Mario's work that made some of those MacArthur geniuses possible, right? And so the work he's going to talk about today is the kind of work that's been flexible, responsible, accountable to the community he's been working in, trying to deal with those curveballs that real world archaeologists deal with, but also in a way that prioritizes the things that the community themselves have found really important, the kinds of things that um, might have stumbled and tripped up a lesser scholar. But for Mario, uh, I think that you'll see that he's managed to not only take that ball and run with it, but really to do something important um, for us as a discipline, but also for the community with which he's partnered. So please help me in welcoming him back to the archaeological research facility before he walks, yeah? Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. So early in the program, I did an oral history project in Amealco municipality in Southern Querétaro. It was in Barrio El Bote in Pueblo San Ildefonso Tultepec. In El Bote, I was based in Colonia 20 de Noviembre, a neighborhood literally inside the Pueblo's namesake Ejido. While I was there, I found an abandoned mud brick building. It was said to be one of the Ejido's first settlements. This building was the core of one of the farms set up in the mid 20th century after government granted an expropriated uh, territory for an Ejido. So I go back to the Ejido and I survey and map the site with permission of the owner and produce oral history about the Ejido's formation. So here's what I know about the Ejido's first settlements. The Ejido was formed in 1930s, but it was settled between 1940 and 1960. Those who built farms had working capital to do so. So they set up farms near Arroyo. So you see those little green boxes there. So their descendants settled in the Aquilos higher elevations in the 80s and 90s when the first generation passed away. And farming continued, but those buildings were abandoned or demolished because they were mud brick buildings. So unable to handle you know, running water, electricity. So they were abandoned. So archaeology of land reform in the Ejido pointed to a bigger problem that I wanted to explore in my dissertation, a problem I call the government designated land problem. So this is the part of the thesis where I launch into, you know, complex theoretical arguments, drawing on, you know, land rights theory, political economy. So basically the TLDR is the need to frame the study of land reform in archaeology from a more expansive analytic time frame. So basically, stretching that green box up there down to this red box. And dissertation aimed to do just that. So although the problem that I theorize is expansive, I just I decided to take a very narrow chunk of that, which is liberal land reform, 19th century liberal land reform, and the role of haciendas uh, in the pre-revolutionary countryside. So and my approach was ethno-historical, combining archival research and oral history. So after rounds of negotiation, I was given access to Amelco's archives where I reviewed the Presidencia collection boxes labeled 1900 to 1918, 
In Querétaro, I reviewed the Fomento Agraria collection from 1915 to 1936. And my approach was to uh, basically read sources for place names and determine how they fit within the land problem that I theorized. And that after that, I would digitize the source, include it in my database, and add keywords and notes. So the work produced an aggregated digital repository of 2,200 sources, all related to the land problem. This included information on liberal land reform, case files on the privatization of municipal propios and tierras de común repartimiento. It also included information on the pre-revolutionary economy and landscape, information on agricultural production and administration. So after that, oral history focused on ex-Hacienda state communities. So in San Ildefonso, I got the indigenous side of land reform. And I wanted to balance that out with oral history and ex-Haciendas. Particularly, I wanted, uh, I wanted to know what um, living descendants uh, knew about their ancestors' reaction to land reform. So my approach was more conversational. Uh, first, I got permission from the municipal authority to be there. I sought out the oldest person in the place. I explained my topic and rationale, and if they were interested, I recorded an interview. If they aren't, I moved on. And so I always made, made a point to return for more conversation. So I talked to 23 individuals in eight different localities. Two localities were indigenous barrios. Six were in ex-Hacienda state settlements. And altogether, I produced about 35 hours of audio. So the, near the end of fieldwork, I got collections from the Archivo Histórico San Juan del Rio. And so the reason I was there is that I was producing oral history in these uh, settlements up there, which were in the municipality. And so it made sense to research the archive on office. And so there I learned that they were going through a digitization initiative. So they no longer let uh, researchers original sources, but they offered researchers working copies of the work. So I got it through an on-site download of, three, of 600 plus PDF files. And so what I got was a full copy of Cabildo from 1600 to 1992, and an up to August 2019 copy of Presidencia from 1918, sorry, uh, 1820 to 1940. So as you can see, it was a lot. So this blue bar here is what I did in months of research, and that's what I got. So as you can see, orders of magnitude more. So I'm back in Berkeley and the next slides, I'm gonna talk about my post field work content analysis methods. So the first thing was the AHSJR digital repository. So what I got from the archive were just a bunch of PDF files with no findings. And so when you look at a PDF file, it looked like the archive had digitized things in the order they came in archival boxes. So a group of apprentices and I reviewed each PDF file for groups and we found about 2,700 groups and that essentially became our ad hoc finding aid. We performed OCR on the collection, keeping um, results that were above 85% and that was the basis of another FileMaker database. So, you know, I know we're having technology issues here so I'll show that database at the end of this presentation. So then after was a transcription of oral history interviews. So they were transcribed either by myself or by apprentices, and also we utilize the Google Voice API and with a post correction. I also included uh, interviews from other researchers in Querétaro. So in Querétaro, there's a really, really rich corpus of oral history interviews from ex Hacienda settlements. And so I thought it was useful to include that because I talked to people's descendants and they actually talked to the people that experienced it themselves. So that was a great way to balance the interviews. So the creation of maps was very essential to my analysis. And this is basically the generalized diagram of the data that I used. I used a lot of government data. I also used HDIS de las Indias for colonial stuff, historic maps, published maps, and all of this was the, the basis for derivative vector and raster layers. So one of the last analysis that I did was environmental modeling using the universal soil loss equation and net logo. So the rationale behind this is that I had digitized the collection of private property titles from the pueblos of Amalco, but uh, the maps that they use, you can locate them in geographic space. But these titles um, indicate a general direction from the pueblo. And so that's why I decided to do this, uh, this modeling. 
and I implemented a net logo. So most archaeologists think of net logo as more agent-based models. This is more deterministic. And so what made this possible was the Mexican drought atlas, which had fine grain information for a Malco. So now I'm going to talk about the chapters that I wrote. And so I have shorthands for them. I call them the Dominguez chapter, the disentailment chapter, and the Hacienda chapter. And these chapters really track my work in Amelco. So the first chapter is about research that I did in the Ejido. And the other two were answers to my dissertation research questions. And so the Dominguez chapter is really a history of corporate landholding in Amelco, in, sorry, in, in Pueblo San Alfonso, from the 16th century to the Mexican Revolution. So this history starts right after the conquest of Mexico, when ancestors moved into the area that is now known as Amalco, which was Tichimek territory, upon learning of the devastation in Mexico Tenochtitlan. So those are the green arrows there. And the yellow arrows are um, entradas that the Spanish did after a decade. So by the 16th century, the area was no longer frontier, and the bubbles of Amalco municipalities start to form, including San Ildefonso. So there's an interesting story about San Ildefonso that it was first settled nearby its first church, Iglesia Vieja, which was never completed because ancestors were resettled to Acuco, um in the 17th century. But that church was uh, looked like a church. And so ancestors were able to kind of retain possession of the territory nearby. Essentially, what I argue in my dissertation is that this church created the conditions for large territorial consolidation. And so you can see here by the late 18th century, that consolidation was extensive. That's that gray area there. And so a lot of sc scholars argue that it was big because of the poor quality of the land. And I think that's true. But I also argue that there was a unique jurisdictional situation with the Pueblo. So notice this is purple, purple circle here. That was its uh its church jurisdiction. And so those are the uh these are the pueblos. They went to Amalco to deal with stuff like marriage, baptism, but things that dealt with land, they went to Wichapan. And so that 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 was also a major factor in uh the large territorial consolidation. So you know, as ethical historians know, once elevated to a doctrina, it's uh being a cabecera is not that far along. And so that's what happened to Amealco. And during the War of Independence, um, the garrison commander of San Juan del Rio was ordered by the then viceroy to annex towns to Amealco. So that is how Pueblo San Ildefonso became part of Querétaro. So this was a very consequential uh, decision because during the 19th century, as Querétaro settled its boundaries with Mexico State, each jurisdictional demarcation tended to split off pieces of land from the Pueblo. And so by the time Pedro Dominguez is born, which is this chapter is named after, um, we can see that, that the Pueblo has a, a big land holding. But on closer look, we see that only a fraction of the population is able to scratch out a living on the territory. And so for life for Pedro Dominguez was defined by subsistence insecurity and modernity. Here, this is a quote from their grandson saying that, you know, life early on was characterized by poor harvests and economic opportunities outside the Pueblo. And so, you know, venturing outside the Pueblo helped the Pueblo learn how to uh, adapt to new environment, to new economic conditions. So here you see more optimal cattle and sheep livestock ratios as time went on and engagement in commercial charcoal production. So we get along to land reform and agrar agrarian agents go to, go to the Pueblo and they see a Pueblo that doesn't fit their model of, of an indigenous community. And so this was very important because it was a major factor in, in the denial of their restitution claims. They didn't look indigenous, they looked indigenous but they acted more like mestizos. So the land granting phase comes along and so the Pueblo gets another chance. And it was people like Pedro Dominguez, well-to-do farmers, people that clearly did not need land that stepped up and helped their community 
achieved that little sliver of land that I did my research on. So that's that's the Dominguez chapter. So the next chapter focuses on disentailment, and I split the chapter in two parts. Essentially, I talk about disentailment before 1867 and afterwards. So before 1867, to privatize a piece of corporate land holding, you needed to sell it. There's no way to, to get private property title. You needed to engage in a private real estate transaction. And so there's evidence that and I'm not sure this happened, but a portion of, of the of the corporate property uh, persisted. So after the restored republic, uh, disentailment was really defined by the resurgence of Hacienda-led agrarian capitalism and uh, the application of federal disentailment mandates, which kind of split what disentailment uh, the process between uh, the head town and the Pueblo surrounding in Amalco. So for the head town, disentailing their municipal properties was meant to comply with the federal ban on owning most kinds of real estate. And what they did is they directed the proceeds to fixed capital assets like uh, irrigation, as in the case here of Llano Largo. So Llano Largo was a large contiguous tract of territory that the municipality sold off to fund the construction of a dam in the district. And so after this, uh, irrigation fees was a major line item in the municipal treasury. Uh, the case of El Diezmo shows how the process could be derailed. So in, cont in contrast to Llano Largo, El Diezmo was a small plot of land at the center of the, the head town's urban core. And so the case file I digitized documents three failed attempts to privatize this property. And every time uh, the, the, the issue came up was, uh, was possession versus ownership. So it appears that the parcel was uh, vacant and the municipality just merely asserted ownership of it, but they never got around to, to uh, issuing a legal title. So every time they moved to sell it, they couldn't. And this is one of the ironies of liberal land reform because uh, the small piece of parcel that uh, municipal ancestors thought would make the street look ugly and they wanted to sell it off it still belongs to the municipality. Today it's known as Jardín Hidalgo. So for the pueblos outside the head town, uh, this entailment was defined by the April 20th of 1870 amendment which, it, which issued uh, prefects to value and issue titles to community members that had possessions less than 200 pesos. And so while I was in Amalco, I digitized 240 property titles that resulted from this process. And so what I say in my dissertation is this is not a complete representation of the process. Obviously, um, limits to my research restricted digitization of more titles. But what I say is that there is enough variation here to treat these titles as artifacts of a particular process. So basically a deal for seriation. And so this is a this is an example of a title. And so there's common elements there that you can just make a basic simple table and track changes over time. And so from this analysis, uh, I I show that this entailment happened in two phases in beginning in San Miguel Deti in 1888 and then being rolled out to the other Pueblos in 1897. And so the process was streamlined over time and overall uh, participation in disentailment was meant for secure land tenure. So by this time, the corporate property regime was kind of on the way out. It became more advantageous to secure private title to your possession than, than keep it within the corporate regime. And so there are uh, sharp differences between uh, how it happened in Pueblos so here we have San Miguel Deti, and you can see that possessions are highly ranked, and uh, you know half the half half the half the people that disentailed had more than one parcel, and so this uh this uh this uh polar chart here counts the direction of the parcels relative to the center of the town, and this polar chart here is um erosion estimates. So you can see that most of the disentailed parcels were in areas that had very little erosion potential. So, so one of the reasons why they're so ranked is because you can see San Miguel Deti is well connected on the road to regional markets and to the head town. In comparison, San Pedro Tenango, 
um, possessions are more equal. People had either one or two parcels of this intent, never more than four. And um, erosion potential is kind of more distributed around the, the Pueblo. And so that kind of explains why the parcels are very small because they're usually located in the small ravines in places where, where you, yearly deposits of sediments can be directed for agriculture. So that, that was the disentanglement chapter. So the last chapter really deals with uh, what, what, what's been underlying this whole dissertation. This idea that before the revolution, Amalco was engaged in a very dynamic capital accumulating system that was led by Hopkander. And this, uh, this idea derived by Simon Miller, a uh, anthropologist that studied haciendas in Querétaro during the 80s. And he argued that haciendas were internally integrated well-organized and highly profitable production units. And that when the revolution came along and uh, with land reform, that this system of, of political economy had achieved legitimacy in the countryside. And that kind of, that, that, that's kind of a provocative assumption because most of Mexico's story about land reform is about how haciendas created immense inequality. And so, it was provocative when it came out, but in Querétaro it makes sense. There was no assault on landed property during the revolution in Querétaro. And there's a well-known resistance to land grants in, in ex hacienda communities. So it's a provocative assumption, but it makes sense. So what I do in this chapter is talk about how uh, haciendas were capitalist in, in Amelco. And I focus on its largest hacienda, which is San Nicolas de la Torre. So this is its ruin. And if you ever go there, you'll notice that it's a lot different than the other ruins along the hacienda roadway. It's bigger, it's more labyrinthian, and it was really the center of a vast farm and non-farm operation. So the core of its operation was agriculture, and that was made possible by the construction of earthen dams. And so the hacienda split its agriculture into different districts called jacales. And so you see here, these are geo-referenced maps of the different farming districts that it had. So think of the hacienda as these jacales as little haciendas within a larger hacienda. So at the center of each uh, jacal was this big house where, where uh, equipment, uh, product, and all the things were stored. So, one of the persons I interviewed in La Torre owns this jacal, and so we walked around the property, and they would show me where the dressing machines were, where animals were kept, and the tracks of private rail lines that the hacienda had developed to shuttle people, commodities to the re to regional markets. So this was a hustling and bustling place, a big industrial farming operation, and so its railroad was in San Pablo. And it branched off from the main Mexican rail line to San Pablo, which was the center of its logging operations. And so this railroad was built in 1860, uh, 1896, and it ran on two foot gauge tracks and its locomotives were from the Baldwin Locomotive Works Corporation out of Pennsylvania. And so it started transferring, uh, trans uh, transferring bulk commodities in 1896 and passengers a year later. So by 1900, we see that the estate is the largest uh, population in the municipality, far bigger than the head town. And it was capable of enormous output. It dominated the wheat market and it produced a lot of maize and a lot of barley. So this is a table of its non-farm operation. So it ran a, a large uh, non-farm operation, including dry goods retail, ironworks, meat packing, woodworking, logging. The only, uh, the only industry not controlled by the Hacienda were textiles. And it had a whopping 18 horsepower of machinery. And so as you can see here, that although it was a, a engine of accumulation, it relied a lot on labor. And that was what managers were always, always complaining about, the need for reliable workers. And so the Hacienda came up with ways to keep people at the estate, literally from not going anywhere else. 
taken on government functions, so they set up their own graveyard. You know, providing schools, maybe uh, getting doctors, and issuing tons of credit. And this is not this is not debt caning. This is this either arrears, meaning that the the hacienda would issue would issue uh, IOUs to to workers that the workers would use to pay for other things. And so they had a vibrant credit system, and of course, you know, discipline. So if you got a line, you you go to jail. So what I argue is that um, what made haciendas legitimate in the pre-revolutionary countryside is that they kind of function like jurisdictions within another jurisdiction. The the kind of uh, accumulation that they were able to to get allowed them to absorb unfunded government mandates to respond to the demand of labor, to provision competitors. So farmers around the hacienda didn't have to go far to get equipment, to get fodder, to get all sorts of things to uh, to accumulate. It was a remarkably stable place. You know, and I'm, I'm kind of painting in a kind of bucolic image, but it, it wasn't a good place to work, you know, from our perspective. But it was incredibly stable comparison to the pueblos uh, beyond the municipality, which were rife with conflict, with uh, administrative instability, because they weren't able to absorb these government issued mandates like the haciendas were. So to conclude, archaeology of land removal, where this all started. Anybody know what this is? So these are all the sites William Sanders, Jeff Parsons, and their colleagues located in the basin of Mexico between 1955 and 1975. So this is famous. This is famous work in Mesoamerican archaeology. And if you look at their monographs, you know, social property, a hebos, sometimes brings comes up, but not a lot. Because this is this is the map we, we typically get to see. And this is the map I want you to see. Notice that there is uh this is social property, this green polygon here. Notice how there is a non-trivial, uh, more than a non-trivial association between the sites Sanders Parsons located and the social property sector. And we can see that at least one in out of every two sites was on social property by the time it was studied. And this is a very conservative estimate. Notice that you see kind of more linear lines here. Those are going flow and and Sanders actually obscured the location of, of sites. So there's probably actually more sites located on social property. And so during that time, Sanders uh, talked to some ejidatarios and they said something I, 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 think, I thought was very interesting. They said between 1940 and 1053, which is a typo, 1953, things were generally bad, that you know harvests were, were pretty crappy. And that's how I, I kind of conclude my my dissertation, saying that you know when government basically destroyed this economy on landed property, it provided no alternative, and it left people to basically pick up the pieces of a new agrarian regime. And how they did it, how they settled social property, was largely undercapitalized and underdeveloped. And that's something that archaeologists have been taking advantage of for a long time. I already talked about Sanders, but there are scores of ethnoarchaeologists that would go to the countryside and, you know, use the underdeveloped social property as, you know, a place to think through ancient Mesoamerican life ways. And now that this phenomenon has become archaeological, I think it's we're in a position to tell the descendants of social property holders how their ancestors may do in a new regime. So a lot of people and a lot of agencies made this work possible. First of all, I'd like to thank my committee, June, thank you. I know at times I could have been a, a, a mercurial advisee, and so I really appreciate the latitude you gave me to develop this work. I'd also like to thank Professor Joyce, a font of information about Hacienda UC Berkeley and its vast apparatus and Professor Laura Enriquez for coming in at a very opportune time. I'd also like to thank uh, community partners at, at uh, San Ildefonso, 
the government officials that let me into their archives in San Juan de Rio and Amalco, uh, URAP participants that helped, helped me analyze this data and various funding agencies that made this work possible. So I'll take your questions if you have them. Oh yeah, it was incredible. How, how, how were, were they treated? You know, we, we do have that negative perspective. Sure, giving some different things. Well, first of all, they weren't. Um, there, there's the the hacienda was was hier hier hierarchical, and so the at La Torre they had a resident workforce, but they also had gangs of laborers that they would draw from the countryside around them, and so they had different obligations, and so. Wage labor, you know, they they got they worked from sun up to sundown, got paid uh, thirty five cents and a ration. Uh, you know, the people inside the 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 resident laborers got a little bit more benefits, and uh, but you know, um, I, I caution kind of projecting our kind of ways of thinking about labor, uh, in in the past because you know, um, you know, it's grueling work, no doubt, it was grueling work, but it was uh it was stable work. And it was work, and, and so what scholars argue is that the the kind of um, quality of life increased not because laborers got better pay, it's because the hacienda was organized in such a way that there was more opportunities to work. So people were working more and earning the same, but but dev devoting more hours to it, as compared to outside the hacienda. Yeah. Yeah. Thinking about the 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 the way the state is, you know, People being more or less indigenous and wasn't up to that. And we very much recognize that in the US as well. Right? Mm -hmm. yeah. So, those, some of those kept the part down. So, you talked about things like irrigation systems. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
machination to destroy your land and water. Right? So there's nothing much of that one with this system of irrigation to or whatever the name of this is. Visible manifestation, you know, in the future. You, know, you raise an interesting point. I don't think I don't think I'm able to answer that right now. But you know, you know we should we should definitely talk about that because you know that's something that that you know that's a really good problem that I haven't talked to yet. Yeah. When I feel retarded in myself, I love to be very valid for the end to rule my people to fix, and I think they were trying to bring up social justice by doing that like the other way. A little bit, a little bit. Not, I'm not quite. Uh, I'm not quite well versed in in uh, that Gordon Willie's work, right? In in the View Valley, but um, you know, they took uh, Sanders and colleagues took a lot of inspiration from that. And so, what I'm trying to point out is, you know, they weren't interested in, in land reform, and so you can't fault them for not studying it explicitly. You know what I mean? But they they used it to think through problems that they had. So now we're at a position where where that stuff is sufficient sufficiently archaeological that we could use it and study it as an object phenomenon itself. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, sure. I can go back. Well, what I'm trying to say is that, you know, I, I, you know, you, they went with a with a state permit, and so you know the state had really defined this social property, so it was a lot entree was a lot easier. Imagine, yeah, yeah. But you know, there's there's also small private property, which you know perhaps they can go in there. So yeah. that's it. So here's a sample of yeah spatial family life, even though they called it when I read it. Yeah. They called the permit. Yeah. And you're saying it's that. Yeah. Five percent social residential. Basically, yeah. 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 It's just, I mean, it's clear they couldn't do the legal sense of that. Right. Yeah. They all yeah. feel like it's fine. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. I just thought, I thought it was an interesting point that archaeologists have actually been studying social property much longer than others realize. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.